All right, welcome to this video. So a question you might be asked in an interview is, how would you design a URL shortener, such as tinyurl? Now before we start off, if you don't know what tinyurl is or URL shortener is, I'll quickly show you. So one of these websites that shortens URL is called tinyurl.com. Let's say I have this URL for this uh, New York Times article, and I'll copy it, head to tinyurl's website, enter in the original URL, and if I click it, it'll give me a shortened URL. So it says the original was 81 characters long, and now it's 28 characters long for this new shortened URL. So it did shorten the URL. And this short URL, if I copy it, right, and paste it onto my, wherever this thing is called, it'll take me to that New York Times article. So paste it in, and it works. So how is this useful? Well. Let's imagine you're on Twitter, right? We all know that Twitter has a character you, uh, limit for each tweet. Well, if you wanted to save characters, right? Well, now we have 60-ish ex 60 extra characters to work with in our tweet. So why do we need URL shortening? Save space when displayed, printed, messaged, tweeted, which I just demonstrated. Users are less likely to mistype shorter URLs and optimize links across devices, tracking individual links to analyze performance, and hiding affiliate original URLs. So businesses would be interested in tiny URL or URL shortener type websites. Okay, so this is not the answer you should diagram out or explain to your interviewer, okay? So we have a user connecting to a load balancer, and we have like two API hit points, right? Create tiny, where you insert a long URL and get long that you insert a tiny URL into. It hits some sort of map where the key is a short URL and the long is the original URL. And in case you're wondering why this is not the answer your, your interviewer wants, I'll explain in the next slide. So the interviewer is not looking for a solution where you take the longer URL, generate a shorter URL, store in a map, and return a longer URL from the map. Because the interviewer is asking you this question most likely to figure out your knowledge on durability and scalability, AKA once your website gets hit by a lot of users, millions or billions of requests or millions of users, whatever, how will your thing be efficient, right? And the previous diagram, it works, but it's not scalable nor durable. So here's our database design. We'll have two things, a URL and a user, right? The URL will have the original URL, and the URL, this URL here will be the shortened one. Then we'll have the original, the expiration date, and let's say the user ID of the person that creates that, let's see, that, that creates that shortened URL. And we'll have a user with name, email, creation date, and last login. Now, you might have noticed that when I demonstrated that example of tiny URL, I, didn't, I did not need to create an account. So you might be wondering, why would we even need a user in the first place? Because a malicious user could consume all the URLs we have available. And to prevent this, we can limit users through an API key. By having users exist in our database, we can, you know, prevent abuse. But a user might not be necessary. But in this design, we'll go with that. Now, our service is read heavy. And there seems to be only one relationship between records. And that one relationship is to store which user create a URL. I emphasize only to emphasize that there's very few relationships in this URL shortening service we're creating. So in general, relational databases such as SQL databases are good for systems where you expect to make lots of complex queries involving joins and such. That's a, that's a mouthful. So in layman's terms, AKA relational slash SQL databases are good if you're planning to frequently look at the relationships between things. No SQL databases are not as good at looking at relationships, but in exchange, they're faster for writes and simple key value reads. So our system, or for our URL shortening services, relational queries will not be a large part of it or they'll occur rarely. Let's go with no SQL. Plus, as we learned from the first section of this course, a NoSQL database is easier to scale with horizontal scaling. So again, this is all to say we're gonna stick with a NoSQL database for our database design. All right, let's identify the core features. Let's say 
in our initial approach to tiny URL, let's say instead of tinyurl.com, we'll call my our URL shortening service kevin.com. And we'll make this shortened URL seven, seven characters long for now, right? It could be eight or nine, but let's go with seven as an arbitrary number for now. And we'll go with the digits zero through nine. Now, if you use the digits 0 through 9, for each space, we can use up to 10 characters. So think of that as base 10. If you use the base 10 system for our short URL, we would only have 10 million possible shortened URLs, right? Because 10 to the power of 7 is 10 million. And 10 million is not really a lot. If we use the base 62 system, so how about instead for our URL here, instead of doing, let's say, 0 through 9, we can also do capital A through Z, lowercase a through z, and also digits 0 through 9, similar to say a license plate. Now we have 62 possible things per space, base 62, and now we have 3.5 trillion possible URLs because of 62 to the power of 7 versus 10 to the power of 7. All right, so actually let me go back a bit. Why do we choose 7? We could have done 6, 8, 9, 10 characters. Why did I pick 7? Well, let's go with 6 first. If we use base 62 encoding, a six letter long key will result in 56 billion possible strings because of 62 to the power of six. Now we make it seven letters long, we get 3.5 trillion possible strings. So the longer our tiny URL is from six to seven to eight or nine, the more possible strings we have. And we have to worry less about our app ever running out. However, the point of this app is to keep our URL as short as possible. So we have to have this like delicate balance, right? The shorter our URL is, the less possible strings there are. The longer our URL is, the less our app will be less likely to run out of things, but we're making our tiny URL longer and longer. So let's go with seven characters. Why? Because 3.5 trillion strings, even we did a thousand keys a second, or you know, a thousand requests a second to our thing, it would take 111 years to run out for 3.5 trillion. So I think seven characters long for our tiny URL is a good medium. All right, let's go for the first solution for how to encode our URL. So we'll compute a unique hash, like use a hashing thing like MD5 or SHA-256 of given URL and then encode using base 62. So let's go with MD5. Put MD5, the long URL, then We'll get a 128-bit hash value back. We'll base 62 encode it, so we'll get something like this. Now, if we use the MD5 algorithm as our hash function, it'll produce a 128-bit hash value, which I just said. And after base 62 encoding, we'll get a string having more than seven characters. Actually, this will be around 21, 22 characters, I believe. We'll just go with 20 plus characters. But our tiny URL should be seven characters, right? And we get 20 plus characters, we can fix this by just taking the first seven characters from this 20 plus thing, right? So this will be the thing for our tiny URL. All right, but I see an issue with this. Could result in key duplication slash collisions in the database, however unlikely this is. Now technically, if we use a hashing thing like MD5 or SHA-256, we should get a unique string. But remember that we're grabbing the first seven characters. Even though they're all unique, perhaps the first seven or six, five, but we'll go with seven, the first seven characters are the same. And there's a chance we'll have key duplication and collisions. Now we can fix this by doing a put if absent to resolve this then choose some other characters from the encode string or swap some characters out to avoid that duplication. However, not all NoSQL databases support put if absent, and we're using a NoSQL database. So how can, is there an, another solution that will avoid duplication and collisions 100% of the time? Yes, this is the second solution. Okay, solution two, guaranteed no duplicates and collisions. Excuse that. So let's say we have a counter that goes from zero to 3.5 trillion, right? And let's say the first time a person requests a tiny URL, we give them the number zero back. We'll base 62 encode that zero, which will give us, for example, this uh, tiny URL. And now this is our tiny link, kevin.com. You can put tinyurl.com here and then this here. 
This is why it's guaranteed no duplicates and collisions because we always give a new number out until we run out at 3.5 trillion. But I see two potential problems with solution two. Number one is I have a single point of failure. What happens if this counter, this counter service or server, whatever, fails? All these other servers will be screwed. Second potential problem is that if the requests spike, our counter host right here may not be able to handle it. So how are we gonna resolve that? I'll show that in the next slide. And lastly, to conclude this slide, I really want to emphasize that we are not encoding the URL. We're having a counter that returns a number and we're, we are encoding the number returned from the counter, which is why we have guaranteed no duplicates and collisions. So to fix this single point of failure problem and this problem as well, we will make use of a distributed systems manager, such as Zookeeper, and that Zookeeper, which is a distributed systems manager, will give the server unused ranges, zero to one million, let's say one million, two million for this server, two million to three million for this server, all the way up to 3.5 trillion. So you might be wondering, what's the difference between this and, well, this? Okay, so you might think, why don't we just run multiple counter servers or counter instances to resolve the problems we present here? But if you have multiple counter servers, right? Who's gonna manage or coordinate all these counter servers? You need something to manage or coordinate them, AKA a distributed systems manager, such as Zookeeper. And just to prove that Zookeeper is this kind of thing, if we head over to the docs for Apache Zookeeper, they say that Zookeeper is a highly reliable distributed coordination. My emphasis on coordination. And of course, the Zookeeper could be a single point of failure. And to avoid that, we'll run multiple instances of Zookeeper. So if Zookeeper ever goes down, then the servers will connect to another instance of it. If a new server is added, like say server four right here, give them an unused range. If range runs out, existing server can go to Zookeeper and ask for new unused range. So let's say server one manages to exhaust this count of zero to one million. Then Zookeeper will give, let's see, three million and one to four million to server one again. If one of the server dies for whatever reason, like say a power outage, blackout, we waste one million possible keys, which is acceptable because we have 3.5 trillion keys at our disposal. However, we are generating URLs in a sequential manner, right, because of the counter thing, and that can be a security threat. A hacker or a malicious user could take advantage of that. So how do we fix this? So again, this is the problem we have, that sequential manner that we generate URLs, and to fix that, we could add another 10 to 15 bits after the counter number to increase the entropy. All right, now let's go over some ways we can make our URL shortening service scale when we have millions of users or say a lot more requests. First solution is a cache. We can speed up database reads by putting as much of the data in memory as possible, AKA a cache. This becomes important if we get a heavy load of requests to a single link, like a popular meme or a Reddit post. If we have the redirect URL in memory, we can process those redirects quickly. Our cache could store the top 20% most used URLs. When the cache is full, we want to replace a URL with a more popular one. A least recently used, aka LRU cache, eviction system would work. And the second way we can scale is a load balancer. Initially, we could use a simple round robin approach that distributes incoming requests equally among backend servers. This would be the, e uh, the easiest to implement. However, a round robin load balancer does not take server load into consideration. So our load balancer would still forward request to an overloaded or slow server. But again, a round robin is the easiest to implement. If we had the time and we really want to make our servers scalable in the long term, we might choose a least connection load balancer or a load balancer that, checks into, that takes into account the least response time or the least bandwidth. All right, here's the final drawing. So throughout this whole system design question, when they ask you to design a URL shortening service, you'll be sketching on a whiteboard. Now, of course, 
Again, system design questions are subjective, but this is what I would draw if I was in this situation. So for our service that's shown in the URL, a user will connect to a load balancer that is least bandwidth, least response time, etc. Connects to these servers, and let's say our server has to fetch the short URL, get the long URL from the short URL. First, it'll check the cache, right, to speed up that speed up that read and response time. And if it's not found in the cache, it'll then check the database. And of course, the database can update the cache, hence this arrow here. And whenever we add a new server or a server runs out of that counter range that we talked about, it will contact the zookeeper, which holds the ranges. Now, for this last slide, I googled around and someone posted a guide that's actually given to an interviewer for the response they want. I just copied it verbatim here. So here's what the interviewer manual or guide says for this question. It says, a poor candidate will propose a solution that uses a single ID generator, single point of failure, or a solution that requires coordination among ID generators on every request. For example, a single database server using auto increment primary key. So you could think of this as the, from the previous video, the second solution first approach slide, where we had just one counter, one counter server or instance, right? An acceptable candidate will propose a solution using an MD5 of the URL or some form of UUID generator that can be done independently at any node. While this allows distributed generation of non-colliding IDs, it yields large shortened URLs. So this contradicts my solution one slide a little bit because I said it is possible for a collision. However, it does, our solution one did yield large shortened URLs. So again, even though I showed a solution one and a solution two, Solution one can still pass, but I recommend solution two. Even the interviewer guide states that. It says a good candidate will design a solution that utilizes a cluster of ID generators that reserve chunks of the ID space from a central coordinator, or as I call it in my slide, a distributed systems manager. Example given, Zookeeper, and independently allocate IDs from their chunk, refreshing as necessary. All right, that should be it for this video.